So let's uh, take our seats, please. Okay, uh, great. So, so let's review where we were. I was talking about um, this, uh, this proof that the permanent um, of, of a matrix over, you know, with entries, a sufficiently large, finite field, uh, is, is sharp p hard um, on average. Okay, so in other words, it's a hard problem not only to compute the permanent of a worst case matrix, an arbitrary matrix, but even of a random matrix with high probability. Okay? Um, and so, you know, the starting point, of course, is that the worst case problem is hard. This is a really famous sort of landmark uh, theorem in, in, in complexity theory. Um, uh, and then, then to sort of boost from worst case hardness, which is the hardness on, uh, you know, of an arbitrary instance, an arbitrary matrix, uh, to this stronger notion of average case hardness, we looked at this uh, simple algebraic property, which is that the permanent is a degree n polynomial in the n squared variables, which are the n by n matrix entries. Right? And then what we, we said is, okay, well, here's, here's the setting. Uh, the goal is to compute the permanent uh, of, our, of an arbitrary worst case matrix that you give me over the finite field, we'll call that x. We, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know how to do that a priori, but, I, but luckily I do have at my disposal, that, you know, by assumption, this sort of faulty algorithm O, or, or algor you know, average case algorithm O, that works to correctly compute most permanents over my finite field, the permanent of most matrices with entries in the finite field FP. In other words, this is what O does. You know, it's like, I think we, we described it as having like a good day and a bad day. Uh, a good day happens one minus one over a polynomial fraction of the time, right, uh, of, the, of the matrices. The, the algorithm outputs the correct permanent exactly, but then on a one over poly fraction of matrices, which is our, our bad day, the algorithm can, um, you know, can, can err significantly. It can do something completely arbitrary. I don't know if, if, if X is, is a good day matrix or a bad day matrix. I have no idea if this, if this algorithm gets it correctly, right? And yet I want to somehow be assured that I, I, I can compute the permanent correctly, right? And so it's a, it, how do I do this? It's a polynomial extrapolation argument. We choose n plus one fixed non-zero points in our field. We can call them T1, T2 through Tn plus one. And then a uniformly random matrix R, and I fix R. This is uniformly random and fixed. I then consider this, this, this line A of t, which is x plus t times r. Two observations, which sort of spell out the proof and are very simple. One is the scrambling property, which is that for each i individually, A of t sub i is a uniformly random matrix over my field. That's just because I took you know, a worst case matrix x and I shifted it by something random, uh, so I get something uniformly random. And then two is this univariate polynomial property, which is that the permanent of A of t is a degree n polynomial in t. And that, of course, follows from, it's kind of inherited from the uh, algebraic property of the permanent itself. Okay? The permanent is a degree n polynomial in n squared variables. Okay, <clears throat> okay but now, now it's, it's, it's clear what we do. We, 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 we take our, our faulty box, O, we evaluate it at these n plus one points, right, to compute the permanent of A of t sub one, A of t sub two, and so on. Right? Well then, you know, because we now have a univariate polynomial um, of degree n, we specified it at n plus one points, well these uniquely define the polynomial, so we can use polynomial extrapolation to reconstruct the polynomial permanent of A of t in the single variable t. Once we do that, we simply uh, evaluate the polynomial at zero to get back permanent of x by construction, because permanent of A of, t A of zero is permanent of x. Mm -hmm. Now, there were several subtleties here, and I think we were discussing them. Um, subtlety one is that this only works the way I've described, right, because this, the, the probability of my faulty algorithm, O, is sufficiently high, right? Because if we can make this one over some, you know, arbitrary polynomial or even a linear quantity, let's say like 100 times n, we can guarantee you with very high probability that all of the n plus one points are correct by a union bound, right? Once they're correct, you know, the, the algorithm works with high probability, okay, to give us back our worst case permanent. All right, another, another um, so we'll talk a lot uh, more about that today. Um, another subtlety that I think is maybe very appropriate for what's coming next is at the end of the day, when we consider quantum mechanics, we really want to consider, uh, you know, the complex or the real numbers, not finite fields, right? Sort of much more natural for our setting when we'll get into talking about random circuit probabilities, because these are fundamentally random circuits with, you know, uh, with entry, you know, uh, with, with matrix entries, if you will, unitary entries and complex numbers, right? Uh, so 
let, let's start with that discussion. So how, what, what, what goes wrong when I uh, try to adapt this argument if instead of finite fields, I had a matrix X that was, say, over the real numbers, and I considered random matrices now over you know, an IID Gaussian ensemble, so each entry is IID Gaussian. So we talked about this a little bit, but can someone tell me what's the obvious problem here? What happens? Yeah. Pre precisely. So, so in other words, it's sort of this scrambling property is sort of broken. It's, it's, it's you know, you take a, a fixed matrix X, you know, um, maybe it's a zero, one matrix or whatever, it's some real matrix, you shift it by something Gaussian, and you have a shifted, you have some shifted Gaussian. You don't have the Gaussian ensemble anymore. That's a problem because the average case algorithm that we're assuming, this faulty algorithm, O, it works only with high probability with respect to the, say, the IID Gaussian ensemble. It doesn't necessarily work with respect to this weird shifted uh, Gaussian ensemble, okay? There's an easy way to combat that, though, and let me tell you how, how it is, and then we'll see that already we see a lot of subtlety in this easy way to do it. So maybe it's not so easy after all, but, but let me tell you what you can do. You can, you can take a different path through the matrices. So you might consider something like this. Um, so let's say instead of A of T equals X plus T times R, let's say A of T is equal to T times X plus one minus T times R. So T times the worst case matrix, plus one minus t times a Gaussian matrix. Now, if, I, if my, box, my box O only works with high probability over IID Gaussian matrices, to compute the permanent, there's kind of a, a, a clear strategy that I would, I would use, and I think I already discussed this, but, but can you remind me what would I do? How would I choose my points? So here, T1, T2 through Tn, if they're finite field points, we don't even care. Any finite field point is fine. No, that's not going to be true anymore, right? But there is a clear strategy. So again, A of T is going to be changed to be T times X plus one minus T times R. Yeah? You need to do something to check that the mean is the same as the original Sort of, yeah. You're not going to check. I, I, check is maybe too strong of a word. But, but yeah, analytically, you kind of want that to be true, exactly. And that's the whole hope. You want to make these, you want to make these points, these, you know, um, A of T1, A of T2, blah, 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 as close as possible to Gaussians. Now, here's a hint. We're not going to be able to, I don't know how to do this so that they're exactly IID Gaussians anymore, the same mean and variance. But there is a strategy that, that sort of gets very close to that. What would the strategy be? How would I, okay, so let me say it one more time. I would really like this to come from you. It's not that difficult. Uh, the, 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 the curve A of T is going to be T times X plus one minus T times R. Ah, if that's the right idea, but it's the opposite of what I was thinking. I think it's close to one or close to zero. Where if it's t times uh, t times x plus one minus t times r, we want to remove the dependency on x. X is very much not random, so we want t to be close to zero. Absolutely. So, so then, what's the strategy? You take a whole bunch of close to zero points, but they're different. But they're close to zero. You use that as your t1 through tn plus one. But then at the end of the day, when you extrapolate and you, you reconstruct the polynomial in T, the pr still permanent of A of T, you then want to evaluate at T equals one, because you get back the worst case matrix. Okay, it's very similar to the strategy we're going to apply for random circuits, but you can already see at a very high level, I'm kind of waving my hands rapidly, but you can already see what's kind of going to happen that's gonna be very tricky here, which is that somehow it seems like we're, we're, we're cheating. We're sort of taking our our, 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 you know, our faulty algorithm, and we're sort of evaluating a whole bunch of points that are really clustered together. And in particular, it's not just that they're clustered together, it's that they're also super far from the point that we actually care about. Okay, so we're gonna see what, you know, what goes wrong there and, and the subtlety, but this is the whole idea that somehow we should be punished. I'll tell you at a high level how we're going to be punished for that. If it was really exact uh, computation, so we could trust that O computes you know, the permanent of A of T1, A of T2, and so on exactly, we, this would be fine, actually. This would not be a problem. But when we start considering approximations where these points are not exactly what they should be, but additively close to them, we'll see that the fact that we have such a big difference between 
a, a distance, a big distance between our worst case point at one and the sort of average case points that look close to Gaussian, that's gonna make a huge difference, okay? It's gonna be like a big part of what we're gonna lecture about today. Okay, questions about that before I go on? It's just a high level. Yeah. Ah, good. No, they're absolutely not independent. And that's the whole point. Yeah. That's why we're using a union bound. Okay. Union, that's the whole point. Yeah. That, that, it, it, exactly. So it's a fantastic. I'm glad you brought that up specifically because it motivates why we're, we're stuck with this one over, at least in this argument, with this one minus one over poly. Because these are fundamentally extremely correlated points. But individually, they look Gaussian. That's what we're doing. No, that's not actually true. That's not actually true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but but you might think so. But it's not. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Other other question. Yeah. Um, is the permanent also Uh, approximating the permanent in what sense? Worst case or average case? Average case. Right. Well, that's what we're trying to prove. Right. Yeah. It's very much the same statement as what we had about circuits. We would want to know about the permanent, and you know, you can ask about that. I even had a boson sampling uh, line in my uh, slide, if you remember that, and that was about this permanent uh, problem. Um, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, hold on. Uh, I agree and I disagree with you. I agree with you in that average case complexity is not well-defined if you don't specify what distribution you're talking about, right? Yes, 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 right. So another way of saying, let me say it in my language, a very good point. You could imagine sort of, you know, uh, giving yourself a much stronger box, much stronger O that sort of worked for like a family of distributions, right? For, that's, I think, what you meant. A whole bunch of distribution. And then, yes, this would, this would work. Unfortunately, it would not connect back to the, the sampling picture and the Stockmeyer's algorithm and so on because of the way the reduction works. So you can absolutely do that. That would get you out of trouble. It just wouldn't connect all the way back to the goal. Uh, other questions? It's a good, really good point, though. Okay, let, let's continue. Um, so now, how do we adapt Lipton's argument from the permanent of a random matrix to the output probability of a random circuit, which is what we really care about? And yeah, that's what the experiment is doing. So the first thing we notice is that actually these are sort of the permanent and the output probability of a random circuit have a lot of similarities mathematically. In particular, they have the similarity we really care about, which is this polynomial structure, right? So I claim that the output probability of a random quantum circuit has polynomial structure. And to see that, you can consider this breaking, up, breaking up the circuits into its two qubit gates. So these CM, CMM minus one, and so on, these are just two qubit gates. Um, and now, the polynomial structure comes from the path integral, right, which says that we can write an output amplitude of this state, let's say the, you know, all zero amplitude, right, as a ginormous sum, insanely large sum of an exponential number of paths, okay, that's the y1, or, sorry, y2 through ym. Uh, but the point is the value of the term of each of these paths, right, is very manageable. It's just the product of m gate entries. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's not hard at all to see that this is a degree, the output amplitude for any fixed out outcome, like all zero, all zero, is a degree m polynomial in the gate entries of the circuit. Right? The gate entries are just these, each, each one of the terms in this product. Yeah. And so in particular, by the Born rule, the output probability, p0 of c, is a, degree, is a, is a polynomial of degree 2m. Here I'm just going to assume that all the entries are real, you can always sort of deal with complex numbers in sort of obvious ways by separating real and imaginary parts. Let's assume everything is real. You have a single polynomial. It's of degree 2m. And it represents the output probability in terms of the entries of the, the, the gate entries of the circuit. Yeah? OK, cool. So this is similar. Now, let's try to use this property, this polynomial structure, to adapt Lipton's proof. Okay, now what does Lipton's proof do? 
At a high level, the idea is we, 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 we're assuming we have the ability to compute the permanent of a random matrix, but we want the, the ability to compute the permanent of a particular matrix that you give me, a worst case matrix that I don't get to choose. So the strategy is clear. You want to take the worst case matrix and you kind of want to make it look cleverly more random because that's, that's what you have the ability to compute. That's the average case problem. So it's all about, this Lipton argument is all about taking the worst case matrix and scrambling it. But scrambling it in such a way that there's still some structure that you can sort of pull back. So we're going to do exactly the same thing for random circuits. Um, here's a first attempt. It's not going to quite work, but uh, it will fail instructively. Um, so the, the idea is, let's say you, you want to compute the output probability of a worst case circuit with M gates. I'll call that C. That's a circuit you give me. I don't get to choose that. It's any circuit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those, those M gates. I'm going to fix M har random two qubit gates. So we'll call them H1, H2, through HM. Those are random. Now, we're, now they're fixed. Okay? Now, here's the idea. We're going to scramble our worst case circuit, but we're going to scramble it in such a way that, that sort of is, that, that uses the implementation of a tiny fraction of the inverse of these har random gates, HI inverse. Okay? So in other words, here's how we're, what we're going to do. And it's supposed to look very much, it should look very familiar, very much like what Lipton is doing um, in this different setting. We're going to let the ith gate of the, of the scrambled circuit, which I'll call ci prime, to be ci, that's the ith gate of the worst case circuit that you gave me, times hi. Now, if you know anything about the har measure, you know that if you take any arbitrary gate, you multiply it by a har random gate, the, the new gate is har random. Okay? So I've totally scrambled things. But that wouldn't be enough for me, because I want to gain this structure. I want to sort of have a, some, some more structure of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by a tiny fraction of the inverse of these har random unitaries, hi. In other words, I'm going to multiply by e to the minus i little hi, which I'm defining to be the log of big hi, times theta. OK, so hold on. Help me out. So why does this have a Lipton-like structure to it? How can I see this as very similar to Lipton's uh, proof? Th I'll give you a hint. Theta is the parameter we should be caring about. So what happens when theta is really small? Scrambles. It scrambles. Absolutely. Approximately scrambles, right? Uh, wh why is that? Because if theta is super tiny, I mean close to zero, right, well then, this is going to be very close to ci times hi. That's completely scrambled, right? What happens if theta is 1? Well, and in particular, we get back our worst case circuit, right? Because if theta is 1, we've implemented ci times hi time, times nothing. Or sorry, if theta, that's, that's just theta 2. If theta is 1, ci times hi times hi inverse, of course, those cancel, give you the identity, you get ci times itself. OK. So what's going to be the strategy? Very similar to Lipton. What do we do? Take a whole bunch of thetas. The thetas are all close to 0. We do some sort of polynomial extrapolation strategy, right? And we then evaluate the polynomial at 1. Exactly. OK. All right, so that's exactly the strategy. We take several non-zero but small thetas. We compute the output probability of the sort of random but correlated circuits. I'll call those C prime of theta 1, C prime of theta 2, and so on. We're thinking about around 2m of them because that's the degree. Maybe 2m plus 1. I'm going to miss you know, uh, certain constants, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter very much. Uh, you take a whole bunch of them. You get, I'll call these random but correlated circuits, sort of for obvious reasons. They're individually, they look really random. But as we've determined already, they're actually quite correlated with each other. Why? Because they're all using the same HIs. Yes? Yes. 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 And we're going to be punished for that. And we will see in a moment. I, I, I agree. It sort of feels like cheating. And we'll see exactly why it feels like cheating in two slides, two or three, something like that, yeah? OK, great. So the strategy is clear. Um, it, this is still not quite right. Uh, and the problem is really simple. It's that e to the minus i h i, little h i theta, 
is not a you know, fixed degree polynomial in theta, right? Um, and so what do we do? Well, at least in, in, as the state of the art in our original paper, the original paper that talked about this, and going back to 2018, right, was to do what any physicist would do when you give them this problem, right? You simply take a fixed order Taylor series truncation of the exponential, e to the minus i, little i, theta, right? So now here's the new way to scramble, and this will sort of work in, in a certain way. Uh, we take the ith gate of the worst case circuit, that's ci, we multiply it by hi, but now instead of multiplying by e to the minus i hi theta, we multiply by the big kth order Taylor series truncation of e to the minus i little hi theta. Okay, this sort of makes us happy and sort of makes us sad. Let me tell you why it makes us happy. Because now each gate entry is a polynomial in theta, because the Taylor series is a gate entry, in, is, a, is, a, is a polynomial in theta. And by the path integral, so is the output probability of the circuit. So we have a polynomial, which is great. That's what we were looking for. That's what we didn't have in the last slide, okay? You can do exactly the same thing. You can now reconstruct the polynomial, which I'll call P, in the single variable theta, and get back the output probability of our worst case circuit. Why am I not happy, though? Something is a little weird about this. Yeah. It's not unitary. We lost unitarity. Okay. So in fact, you know, the, the interesting thing is here is how, how do you motivate the fact that you're taking these, these Taylor series truncations, which actually, like, like he just said uh, very correctly, make the distribution that we're, we're sort of now supported on, right? Well, the support consists of circuits that are not really even circuits. They're kind of slightly, ever so slightly non-unitary circuit. Now, they're very close to a unitary circuit because you can push that Taylor series truncation to be like an arbitrary polynomial parameter. And so in real terms, they're very, very, very close, like exponentially close in some sense. Uh, but they're not quite unitary. And so, you know, what I just described to you took the first three, pa three pages of our 30, 50 page manuscript. The rest of it was trying to prove this result, okay, which says the following. Well, remember the goal here was not to prove that exactly computing the output probability of the circuit was hard. That was sort of something that we were doing because it was sort of necessary but not sufficient to prove sampling hardness, but we really wanted this estimation, this one over two to the n additive estimation. So what we show, and I, I think this is sort of the main technical result of our paper, is that in fact, if that's what we care about, you know, the hardness of giving additive estimates to the output probability of the random circuit, then in fact it doesn't matter if you, formally, if you take the truncated circuit or the unitary circuit, this is a difficult result, but it, but it relies on, uh, I think, in, in pretty obvious intuition. You know, intuitively, it's because the truncation error that we're making when we truncate the Taylor series at a fixed order, right, is so much smaller than the size of the additive error that we want to be hard in the first place. And here's the, the picture. You know, the red dash here is what we're showing is hard. That's the output probability of C prime, which we're defining to be the truncated circuit, right? What we want to be hard is this little, this black dash right next to it. It's very close to it. It's like exponentially close. Uh, it's the output probability of the unitary circuit. But then we are making this conjecture that outputting anything in this much wider interval around the black point, right, the true output probability of the random circuit was hard. And so intuitively, if we're going to make that crazy conjecture, right, it shouldn't really matter if the center of the interval was like, you know, what was, was the unitary circuit, which is a really, really, really close to that unitary circuit relative to the error that we're, we're going to be assuming is hard anyway. So we prove that's true. And so at the end of the day, this is really just something, the truncations we think of as just happening in the analysis. You can, you can think, the it doesn't change the experiment, it didn't change the circuit, but it took a lot of work, okay? Uh, and, you know, I think luckily for everyone involved, um, you know, more recent follow-up work by Ramis Mobisag showed, in fact, a very related argument um, that eliminates the need for these truncations altogether. Now, I'm not going to describe that, this, but you can read about it. It's called the Cayley path. It, it's just, it's exactly the same argument that I just described. It uses this Lipton-style polynomial extrapolation. The only difference is that the way, the way he goes from the, okay, so the way he draws a path, if you will, from the worst case circuit to the random circuit is different, right? Still uses the same strategy, but it has the property that it, that, that path stays, stays unitary on every point, okay? So we don't need to worry about this anymore, although this was the primary worry in our original paper. Yeah. 
Yes. No, no, it should be like 1 over k factorial. Yeah, and the point is you can take k to be an arbitrary polynomial. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right, right, right. But the point is, is that the power of the oracle, that whether it solves it for unitaries or slightly non-unitary oracles, is the same. That's the formal result. Um, great. And I don't think about it as an oracle, but yes, you can think about it. I just think about an algorithm that works on the average case. So we're comparing two algorithms. One is an algorithm that works with respect to a distribution that's supported on slightly non-unitary circuits. The other is unitary circuits. The same power. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about exactly the dependence on theta. The truth is theta is super small. So these things end up sort of coming out in the wash, but we'll show exactly what, what we'll, we'll show, we'll, we'll get more formal about this. The very important question, like how close exactly is the distribution over circuits with respect to theta from the true distribution that we care about? And we'll, we'll answer that in a moment, I promise. Uh, any other question before we go on? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's right. I think this will be. I think this will be clear. It you get an exponentially close accuracy. Um, let, let, let's okay, good. So now, uh, okay. What I want to discuss next is the what we really care about the the um, the robustness to additive error of this method. Okay, and this will take us to the research frontier. We'll, we'll get to the, you know essentially the end of the literature. Okay, uh, so what we've been doing since 2018. Yeah, um, among other things. Uh, Okay, so, so far we've assumed the ability to compute the output probabilities of these random but correlated circuits uh, exactly, right? We assume that we could exactly compute, uh, you know, the output probability, which I'm calling P0 of C1, you know, uh, sorry, of C, C prime theta 1, C prime theta 2, and so on, right? These are these correlated but ran individually random looking circuits. But of course the actual setting is, is approximate. It's additive approximation. So we're, giving, we're given 2m evaluation points, theta 1, y1, theta 2, y2, and so on, so that for 2 thirds, let's say, of these points, right, uh, the, 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 um, the evaluation yi is delta close to the output probability of these random but correlated circuits. And remember the delta we want is 1 over some constant over 2 to the n, right? That's what we need to, to get hardness of sampling by Stockmeyer's algorithm. We've established that earlier. We're not going to be able to show that, but we're going to be able to show this for sort of increasingly larger and larger deltas. Okay? That's the goal. So, so actually, if you look at the picture it, it, that I have in my head here, it looks a little bit like this. We're really considering two polynomials, right? There's the polynomial I'll call P of theta, okay? That's the single variate polynomial that encodes the true output probability of these correlated but individually random circuits, right? Uh, and then there's the extrapolated polynomial. I'll call that Q, right? That's the polynomial that, you know, that we get access to by using, say, Lagrange extrapolation on our points, right? So in this picture, the points here are these, these red points. Those are some approximations to the output probability of the random circuit. I should say, actually, now that I look at it, this, this picture is a little bit optimistic. One thing that's missing here is it seems like all of the red points are kind of hugging the ideal curve, the black curve. But in fact, we know that like one third of them could be like, you know, out in space. Okay, but anyway, it's a little bit optimistic, but whatever, you get the point. You have, you have these, uh, these, these red points, they're encoding you know, an approximation to the output probability of these random circuits, but then what you actually, what you actually do is you extrapolate, and you have this blue, this blue polynomial, which we call Q. That's what comes out of your Lagrange extrapolation process. Okay? Now, you know that within this tiny subinterval of the unit interval 0, 1, which we'll call 0 through theta max, right? that's your largest theta that you choose, these two, you know, these two polynomials are, are pretty close to each other, whatever that means. We'll formalize that in a moment, but they're pretty close to each other, right? But then what we really want, as we've, we've said many times now, is not 
you know, the polynomial, the difference of the polynomials in zero through theta max, we want the difference of the polynomial all, all the way over at one, because that's encoding the worst case point. Right? We really, in, this, in, this, in this language, we really want to know p, you know, p of one, right? which is encoding the output probability of our worst case circuit by construction. Okay? So the question that we should be asking is how close are these two polynomials all the way at one in terms of the two parameters that we have, which is delta, so that's the error, right? And theta max, that's the largest extrapolation point that we have, okay? Now, this answer, the, the answer was actually given to us in some sense by, um, by uh, you know, this beautiful result due to Paturi in the early 90s. Now, Paturi was not thinking about quantum computing, as far as I can tell. He was thinking about approximation theory. And he comes up with this result. So he says the following, uh, I think it's really nice. Um, if we have a degree, uh, let's say a real polynomial in a single variable, z of theta, and it's degree d, and it's bounded in a certain subinterval of the unit interval of width theta max, yeah? Then, all the way at one, that polynomial is upper bounded by delta, right? That's the error within the box, right? Uh, times two to the d times theta inverse max, or theta max inverse, okay? So in other words, in our case, what's the polynomial we're gonna consider? We're going to consider the degree 2m polynomial, which we'll call z in theta, which comes from subtracting the ideal polynomial and the extrapolated polynomial, okay? And the picture now looks something like this. If we're thinking about it in terms of z, we've bounded the polynomial in a box of width theta max, height delta, so that's your error, yeah? But we don't care about it there, we care about, unfortunately, right? We care about it all the way at one, and the problem is that it can jump, okay? In general, it does. How much does it jump? Well, in the worst case, by delta times two to the O of D <coughs> theta max inverse, okay? So what is, what is Paturi saying here? What he's saying is, is the following. If, if, if the goal is to reduce the error at our worst case point, that's to make z of one in the language of the prior slide, as small as possible, we have two choices, right? We have to focus on the stuff that's that has an exponential dependence, which is d and theta max inverse. So in particular, we can either make d smaller to reduce that exponential dependence. That's really hard. I don't know how to do that, in fact, right? It's really hard because that d in circuits is, it's not, it's not depth. The degree, it, it's close to depth, really, it's m. It's the size of the circuit, which is d times n. Yeah, you're right, there's two d's, that's a little bit weird. Now, the d here is a degree, and it also happens to be uh, like 2m, which is two times the size of the circuit, the depth times number of qubits. And so that's really difficult. To, to reduce the depth for this, for this Paturi argument, we're going to have to change the polynomial, which I, I don't know how to do, okay? Um, not even clear that's, that's possible. Um, okay, but wait a second, there's another parameter right, which is this theta max parameter. So the other thing Paturi says you can do if you want to decrease z of one is increase theta max because the dependence on the exponent is theta max inverse. So you increase theta max. That's very intuitive that that would reduce your error. Why is that? Because what are you doing? You're bringing the points closer to the worst case point, right? Very intuitive that that should reduce your error. Okay, so what's in this argument what is, what is determining how large we can set theta max? That's, that's the important question, okay? So let me tell you what it is. It's really this Lagrange extrapolation, the fact that at the end of the day, we really wanted, we were sort of being perfectionists, we wanted to get every single point correct, okay? Remember we wanted a union bound, and the point of the union bound was that, you know, we wanted to take the probability of the faulty algorithm, the average case algorithm, to be so high that with high probability, with you know, probability five, six or whatever, you get all the points correct. So that means that we need the algorithm, the average case algorithm, to succeed with probability greater than or equal to one minus something like one over m. Maybe it's one over two m. Right, that's so that by a union bound we can ensure that it's correct on all points. Okay, good. Okay, but now let's think about this. As theta gets larger, this doesn't come for free. As theta gets larger, right, the, the, the scrambled circuit, the scrambled but correlated circuit is getting closer and closer to the worst case circuit, and it's looking less and less random. Remember, we go back to what we talked about in the permanent case. It's exactly the same thing. There's clearly a penalty for 
you know, making all of your points like essentially the worst case point. There has to be a penalty there, right? Okay, cool. Well, where does it come in? Well, it turns out, I'm not gonna prove this, it's not so hard to see if you know basic facts about the Haar measure, the distribution of the circuit C prime of theta is, is, is O of M times theta close in TVD to the truly random circuit, okay? And, and so what that means is that the worst case, the, sorry, the average case algorithm is going to work less well as theta, as, you, as theta gets larger and larger. How much less well? Well, with probability one minus M times theta on these points, that's a property of the TVD. Uh, and so if we want one minus M times theta to be one minus order of one over M, that requires setting theta to be one over M squared, right? Okay, now if it's one over M squared, or smaller, we now plug in Pateri's bound, right? We get that Z of one, the error of our worst case point, that's what we care about, is upper bounded by delta times two to the D times theta max inverse, which I'm just plugging now, plugging in, right, is delta times d, uh, time, uh, delta times two to the m, right, that's, the, that's d, or like 2m, whatever, doesn't matter that much, times one over theta max, right, so that's m squared, we get, we need delta, little delta, to be like one over two to the m cubed to compensate for the blow up, okay? This is, so this is, this is actually how accurate we need uh, if we're going to use this Lagrange method. Questions about that? It's good? Excellent. So, okay, so now we want to improve this, and we were stuck on this for several years, maybe for like two years, two or three years. Um, and, but what we, what we knew is that if we want to do better, we're going to have to have a new error-robust means of polynomial extrapolation. We can't use Lagrange extrapolation because that's what's getting us stuck you know, demanding, being a perfectionist, demanding that the algorithm gets all the points right is precisely why we're stuck in this argument, as I just showed in the last slide. So to improve the imprecision, we need a new error-robust means of polynomial extrapolation. Okay, we're gonna do this by oversampling. Remember, one, uh, one parameter that we had sort of at our disposal is that so, so far we were always taking the number of points to be, you know, like the degree of the polynomial, like 2m or whatever, plus one. But there was nothing stopping us from taking the poly, you know, some much larger polynomial, right? That's, that's something we have at our disposal. It's just a, you know, it makes the reduction a bit slower, but just polynomially slower, okay? So here's the, here's the main theorem that we prove, and you know, I'm not gonna prove it here. Uh, it's quite a technical theorem, but um, the, the point is just to tell you, to sort of uh, get you to uh, be inspired maybe to read about it. Um, we call this the ro robust burlikamp welsh theorem. Um, the reason it's called that is because it's similar in spirit to a, uh, a theorem that was known for finite fields. It's very similar. Uh, it's used in classical error correction. But anyway, here's what the theorem says. It says, suppose I give you order of d squared, uh, faulty evaluation points, theta one, y one, theta two, y two, all the way up through d squared, uh, uh, to, to, this, to a single variate real polynomial theta of degree d with two properties, okay? First, uh, all of these thetas are in this, this narrow subinterval of the unit interval, which happens to be of width one over d. That's really important, actually. So it's one over d, okay? And two, we know at least two-thirds of these points, of, of the yi, are delta close to the evaluation of the polynomial at theta i, okay? That's the property we get. Then what we show is suppose someone gives you another polynomial. We call it q in theta. Okay? The only thing we know about this, this polynomial Q is that it's delta close on a potentially different two-thirds of these points. Okay? Maybe a different two-thirds of these points than the original polynomial is close on. We don't know. Okay? But no matter what polynomial so this, you know, this adversary chooses, as long as it's delta close on two-thirds of these points, well then it needs to be delta times two to the O of D close to P of theta for any theta in this interval. Okay, so here's the picture. Okay, so we have the black curve. This is now a more accurate picture of what's going on than the last one, by the way. We have the black curve that's encoding the output probabilities of these, you know, random but correlated circuits, right, that are parameterized by single, vari single real variable theta. And then we have this, this uh, but we're not given that. We're not lucky enough to be given that, that polynomial, um, you know, exactly. Instead, we're given these red points, and these red points are faulty, right? What do I mean by faulty? I mean two-thirds of them are within delta 
of the, of the black curve. That's, you can see that, right? Uh, but then one third of them are like wildly off, and we don't know which is which. You know, we're not that lucky. Okay? But what this theorem tells us is that if I give you any blue curve that hugs a potentially different two thirds of the points, then no matter what blue curve you give me, within the subinterval 0, 1 over d, the maximum that the blue curve can differ from the black curve is like delta, <coughs> sorry, is like delta times 2 to the O of d. Okay? All right, so I'm not proving this, but, um, but this is our theorem. Now, this robust Burleigh-Camp Welsh theorem helps us. It's going to allow us to take theta max larger. Okay? Let me say why. Yeah, go, sorry, uh, please. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. I will tell you how we come up with Q shortly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. For now, we don't, this is an information theoretic statement. It has no, nothing about uh, the complexity of coming up with, with Q. We have to worry about that, of course. All right, cool. So now, here's the idea. Um, we're, we're given these faulty points to the polynomial, uh, P of theta, right? Again, we, these are these, these, say, m squared points. The degree is like 2m, whatever. Uh, theta 1, uh, y1, theta 2, y2. We know that 2 thirds of these points are delta close to the original polynomial. Right? Then one third of these points are crazy and they're off. Yeah? Okay. So now here's what we're gonna do. This actually answers Alex's question. Uh, we're gonna ask an NP oracle okay, to give us any polynomial Q that's delta close to a potentially different two thirds of these points. Okay, wait a second. There's two questions there. One, why is that fair game? Seems like I pulled that out of my hat. Why is that fair game? Any ideas? Why do I have it? It happens to be that Without loss of generality, with this reduction, I have an NP oracle left over. Where, where did I use an NP oracle already in this reduction? Going from the Stockmar algorithm, going from sampling to computing. So we already have an NP oracle, so we can use one. Second question, why is this an NP problem? That's not, I mean, that, that is clear, but it's not entirely clear, right? It's, what is an NP problem? It has to be something that you can check, right? So your adversary sends you a polynomial. You might worry that your adversary cheats you somehow. But he's not going to, he or she. He's not going to. Why not? There you go. You just check the points one by one, right? We're not saying, we're not demanding any relationship between the, the polynomial that the NP oracle sends you and the original polynomial P. That we couldn't do. We're just saying, as long as the, as long as the adversary sends us any polynomial that's delta close to two thirds of these points, any two thirds of these points, well that clearly you can check by just seeing how close the adversary's polynomial was to each of these evaluation points. And you accept if two thirds of them are within delta and you reject otherwise. So this is an NP problem. Okay. Good. Okay, the way I presented it, it's absolutely a, like, like a, a relation problem oracle where the out, or whatever, the output is like a, I think, but there's a, there's a um, uh, sort of a binary search like reduction, there's a, there's a search decision reduction, so it doesn't need to be uh, stated like that. I'm not gonna get into that, but read the paper. Doesn't, that's not a limitation of this approach. Um, okay, so this can be easily checked. Now, what does robust Burleigh-Camp Welsh theorem says? Well, it says within, within the small interval, zero through one over m, right, no matter what polynomial Q the NP oracle sent you, right, uh, you're now bounded by this delta prime, which is within, within this interval 0, 1 over n, which is now, by the Burleigh-Camp Welsh theorem, delta times 2 to the O of m. The m is the degree. Okay. Now, we plug in Pituri. Now, what do we get? Well, we get that the blow up is delta prime. I'm just defining delta prime to be delta times two to the m. So we have delta times two to the m times two to the O of d. D is again about m, right? But now times, you know, theta max inverse. But theta max now is actually what? One over m. Theta max inverse is m and we get that to compensate for the blow up, which is two to the m squared, we need to take delta to be one over two to the m squared. This saved us by, you know, a uh, factor of m in the exponent. We went from one over two to the m cubed to one over two to the m squared. Questions? Yes? What the difference is? 
It's all about the fact that we're willing to make errors here. Okay? It, it, we, by oversampling, we can compensate for those errors using, uh, using, using error correction techniques. And the only difference, that the, the quantitative difference, which is very clear, is that it allows us to take theta max instead of 1 over d squared, 1 over d. Yes. Uh, yes, that, uh, yes, 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 that's, that's, that's the way to say, yes, we took m squared points, much more points, but now in a in, 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 in much, yeah, much larger uh, subinterval, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, great, but I advertise 2 to the minus m log m, okay, so there's one more trick here, it has to get you from 2 to the minus m squared to 2 to minus m log m, here, here it goes. Um, Remember what is the input? We're given these faulty points, same thing. So it's like theta 1 y1, theta 2 y2, and there's m squared of them, and each one lives from, one to, from 0 to 1 over m. That's what we just described, yeah? All right, now, what did we do before? We asked the, the NP oracle for a, degree <coughs> for a degree 2m or whatever polynomial that delta agreed with 2 thirds of these points. That's what we asked. Okay, now we're going to do something just a little bit more, uh, a, little bit, a little bit different, okay? Um, here's the trick. Rather than asking the NP oracle for this approximating polynomial Q of degree M, we're going to consider just substituting the variables in this, in this, uh, uh, in this polynomial. It's just a, um, you know, a, a formal replacement of variables. We're going to replace a the variable theta with theta to the K for some large K that I'll fix in a moment. And we're going to ask for this new polynomial, theta K, uh, theta prime, in uh, not Q prime in theta K, okay? In theta to the K, all right? Now, equivalently, what's going on here, maybe easier, a little easier to follow, is that we're going to ask the NP oracle, rather than giving them the point, these faulty points, theta 1, y1, theta 2, y2, we're gonna ask the NP oracle for the points theta 1 to the 1 over K, y1, theta 2 to the 1 over K, y2, and so on. Okay, now hold on, this is really counterintuitive that this is going to help us. Oh, and, and sorry, let me say one more thing. We're also now, of course, going to compensate by asking for a larger degree to compensate for the one over K. So rather than asking for a degree 2M polynomial, or say M polynomial, it's now an M times K polynomial. Yeah? Now hold on, this sounds really counterintuitive. It sounds like we just compensated somehow by blowing up the degree of our polynomial. That has to be bad news. Has to be bad news because Wait, why actually? Because Paturi's blow up is, is two to the D, right? So we just, we, we, we just took one for the team there. We blew up the degree. We made the blow up worse in some sense. Okay, but what, what happens to theta, to, to theta max? And that's the important thing here. That's, that's where we're saving. Well, before it was whatever it is, you know, the largest of these thetas, right? And we knew that the largest of these thetas was one over M, right? That, that was the, um, that's how we chose them, right? Now, what is it? Well, now it's that theta max, whatever it was, which is at most 1 over m, to the 1 over k. Yeah? That, that's, how we, that's how we gave it. Okay, so now we're going to plug that in to Paturi's bound. Right? We're going to see that we make progress. All right, so P Paturi's bound says z of 1 is upper bounded by delta times 2 to the degree it's now km, but theta max is now m to the, or 1 over theta max is now m to the 1 over k. Because it was 1 over m to the 1 over k, and now it's m to the 1 over k. All right, we're going to take k to be log m, and what do we get? Well, we get log m times m, right? And then we get m to the 1 over k, which is subleading, it's some constant. Yeah, you can do that in your head, hopefully. Um, uh, but you can trust me, it's subleading, and so, we get, to, we, we get that this blow up is delta times 2 to the m log m. And so to compensate for the blow up, we need to take delta in the order of 1 over 2 to the m log m. Okay. That is the state of the art. Can I take questions on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, okay, good. Um, yes, you do need to take more points, but remember we can take as many points as we want. In particular here, we are already taking like m squared points, right? Uh, so we don't have to take that many more points, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, not, not m to the 2k. Um, you, just, you just need like m squared. So you, whatever your degree is squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, more, yes?
That's right, that's right, that's right. To do, to do any better, okay, if you're going to just use this argument, then you only have one place to go. Um, uh, but you could also do something, I think that's not really the hope that we have. I think the hope that we have to do better is that you can use something more about the, the nature of these polynomials. So in fact, you know, I'm gonna say this sort of in passing because it's a little bit complicated, but this is essentially tight. You can't really do better if you are not going to use some special property of the polynomial that comes out of the circuit. You, you can see that because Chebyshev polynomials end up essentially saturating these bounds. But that doesn't mean that the polynomial that comes out of this extrapolation that comes from the circuit, right, is a Chebyshev polynomial. It's probably not. But we have to understand why not, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do better than these bounds in this parameter regime, okay? Um, yes? No, it's, it's, okay, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do math on the spot, but, but this, should, this should all be a constant at the end of the day, okay? You should work it out. It's m to the one over log m. Yeah. Do we agree with me? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Should be some small constant, like two or something like this, yeah? Um, okay, it looks scary, but it's not. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. It does absolutely say about that. Let's go back. I hope it does, otherwise I messed it up, which is possible. Aha, uh -huh, here it is. So the, each of the theta, theta i's have to be between zero and one over the degree. Ah, the distance between them. Yes, okay, good, 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 okay, right. I thought you were meaning the distance to the worst case point. Yeah, there, is, there, there are some technical requirements about the distance between them that I'm dropping, but it's not very, they're, they're not very, um, uh, it's not very large, okay? You're, you're sort of already paying for the fact that these points are very clustered by this exponential blow up. I mean, that's the intuition, yeah. Um, okay, great. How much time do I have, Alex? 10 minutes, okay. I would like to keep going, but I'm happy to take questions. This is um, essentially the end of this particular section. More questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. You mean this non-unitary thing, yeah. Yeah, 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 yes. Well, you, we, we sort of know that, right? Because we know exactly how much error we're incurring uh, in total variation distance, right? Between the, these two distributions, the distribution on the one hand over the uh, truncated circuit and the distribution of the, uh, you know, of, the, of the unitary circuit. And you can bound these things, right? Um, it, yeah, for theta you do have, yeah, right. It's a good question though. Can we keep them coming, anything else? Yeah. No, uh, what if you or do you? You do not in the way I do. What if, what if I did? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure you would gain anything there. My guess is that it would, the error would depend on the max theta, essentially, that you choose. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on, but you could work it out. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, there are certainly other ways you could imagine you know, extrapolating. And at the end of the day, you can also use this Cayley path, which is more elegant in the sense that you don't use the, you don't use unitarity. Again, we think of that as an analysis trick, but it's a very nice analysis trick in that it saves us 25 pages of work or whatever, yeah. Okay. Let me end with some comments and open directions. So still we haven't resolved what I consider to be the main question here, which is to push this, this, this imprecision uh, to two to the minus n. Um, let me also say there was another paper on the archive relatively recently which claimed that they got robustness two to the minus m. Um, this paper had some new results and used a lot of the techniques that you just saw. Um, we haven't actually been able to verify this paper yet though, so, I'm, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really stating it as a theorem until I can kind of work it out myself, okay? It's not, not that it's wrong, I just personally can't verify it. Nonetheless, the state of the art could be two to the minus o of m, okay? Could be that the ideas are already there. Um, not gonna make any more comments about that. Uh, or boson sampling, things get better, um, you know, uh, essentially because the size of the Hilbert space 
changes. So what we wanted is one over e to <coughs> one over e to the n log n, because that's the relative dim that's the dimension of the of the uh, of the Hilbert space in, in, in a bosonic sampling problem with uh, m equal n squared modes, n is a photon number. And if you work the same argument out, you get one over e to the six n log n. So we're off by a factor of six in the exponent. Notice you still have this sort of n log n, and the degree here is n because the permanent of, is, is of degree n. So it's really the same argument, just gets you, know, gets you a little closer to what you want because you wanted e to the n log n, okay? Um, the other thing is that we've also discovered barriers that I'm not really going to describe so much, but saying that we'll, we'll need some new proof techniques if we want to get further. And I already talked a little bit about one, the fact that there's this like Chebyshev polynomial that in principle sort of saturates these, these upper bounds. Um, but there are others as well saying that, you know, maybe the fact that we need to go from, you know, six to one, for example, in the exponent for boson sampling, it might be harder than we think it is, okay? Um, okay, great. I want to move on though. Um, this is starting a very new thing. We'll probably have, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let, let me say your question a little bit more precisely, which will show how important it is, okay? All of these arguments are really using the degree. That's really what they're using, right? They're using an exponential blow up in the degree, I don't think there's gonna be a way around that. Now, the problem is for random circuits, that degree is m, which is n times d, always bigger than n. We want n, right? That seems really problematic, right? Um, and you can think of that as a barrier. On the other hand, there's, there's a few, there's a few um, uh, what, what I say, hopeful uh, suggestions that I'll, I'll give out there. We don't have an answer. If I had an answer, I would, be, I would have solved the problem. Um, you know, it's a hard problem, but one thing is that actually this new paper, which we're still sort of looking at um, to get two to the minus m, does exactly that. It finds a new polynomial which actually does have a reduced degree, okay? Um, now, again, I, I don't wanna talk more about the paper, but I think that there's an interesting idea there which actually works by reducing the degree in some sense. Um, the, the, you know, the second thing I'll say is that, again, I think to do better, we're, we're, we've sort of reached the point at which we're not gonna be able to just use polynomial extrapolation, precisely for this reason, right? Because you're always gonna have an exponential in the degree if you just use polynomial extrapolation. But the hope would be that the points that are actually coming out of this, the polynomials that are actually coming out of this might be able to be approximated by a considerably lower degree polynomial, right? Um, and in fact, you know, we've done a lot of thinking about this. I think this is actually somewhat promising. Yeah, uh, yes, please. Yes, yes, uh-huh, and I talked a little bit about that, but it is confusing, so maybe I'll spend a little time talking about that. Um, in the beginning, when we talked about, you know, these, these sum problems, which is a much simpler discussion, I think, um, these, these quantum sum problems and these classical sum problems, we were talking about a uh, multiplicative error always, right? Um, you know, but then when we went to talk about the output probabilities of random circuits and this delta circuit estimation problem, we went back to, delta being an additive error. But I think I said at the time, and I'll say again, because it's important, what, the quantity we want is one over two to the m. Now that happens to be one over the Hilbert space dimension, but more importantly, it also happens to be the size of a typical out outcome probability of a random circuit, right? And that means actually that, uh, that we know that that's the, the, if you have a one over two to the, uh, sorry, one over two to the n, uh, you know, additive error estimate to the outcome probability of most random circuits, that suffices to give you a one plus, plus or minus one over poly multiplicative error estimate. Precisely because the additive error, if you multiply out the multiplicative, you get epsilon times the, you know, the quantity itself. That's the additive error that you make when you're multiplicatively approximating things, right? Uh, and if you can show that the size of that quantity is usually around one over two to the n, then in fact, the additive error that gives you a multiplicative error is one over two to the n. So I made a sleight of hand, right? I went from multiplicative error and then I went to additive error. Why would I do that? Any idea, what, what was I thinking? Why would I do something like that? Because what was I trying to show next? So I, I wrote every, it really was multiplicative error. I then made it additive error just by multiplying out what the, multi what the multiplicative error was. But why would I wanna do that? Can you, was it just sort of a crazy idea? Because what could I actually show when I, look, when I use these polynomial extrapolation results? 
additive errors, right? That's what I can actually show. I can't show the multiplicative error, which would be this two to the minus n, okay? So that's why I wrote everything out additively. That was a choice, it was a pedagogical choice. It wasn't necessary. I could have also said, look, I'm look I want, what I want is a multiplicative error, and I can't get it. Instead, I can get these additive errors that are getting sort of larger and larger and closer to two to the minus n, yeah? Great, how, how much time? Okay, I, I don't want to. Then I don't want to go to a totally new uh, section, but I'm happy to take you know one or two more questions. We're all out of questions. Okay, let's take them offline. When we come back, we'll talk about um, benchmarks. These are actually um, uh, much closer to the experiment, much closer to how we verify the experiment, and asking if there's a hardness in sort of different signals. So not bounded TVD, but uh, other things that you can ask about the output distribution of the experiment, okay? Thanks a lot, I'll see you next time.